Hermann Göring ominously summarized German policy towards the Soviet Union when he made a typically sinister speech late in 1941. Many tens of millions in the industrial areas will become redundant and will either die or have to emigrate to Siberia. In little more than one year, Göring's promise had been made good. Hitler's armies had reduced vast areas of Western Russia to dust and rubble and subjected the Soviet peoples to unimaginable brutality. Russia experienced an agony of brutality as she was dragged through a nightmare of slaughter to the edge of extinction. The launch of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, was Germany's most desperate gamble of the Second World War. It was a gamble Hitler felt compelled to take, if his ambition of the complete subjugation of Europe was to become a reality. Three million German troops were initially committed to the most appalling conflict in the history of warfare. In the course of the next four years, she would need to find three million more. The whole ideological thrust of the German plan for war was different. This was not a conventional war of conquest. It was intended to be a war of extermination. It was intended to root out what Hitler called the Jewish Bolshevik gang who ran Russia. It was designed to destroy the political structure both of the Soviet Union and of the Red Army. In consequence, the terrible barbarization which set in at the first stage in the Soviet-German war was to become the overriding feature which persisted until the very last day Standing between Hitler and the realization of this vision were the armies of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, a fighting force whose condition of disorganization was mirrored by the paranoia of its political leadership. The disarray in the ranks of the Red Army was a direct result of the excesses of Stalin, who had carried out a systematic purge of the Red Army. In 1936, Tukhachevsky, chief of staff of the Russian army, was executed for treason following a trial which lasted only a single day. Six of the eight generals forming the court-martial which condemned him were themselves to follow suit soon after. By the end of the purge, the Russian army had lost three of the five remaining marshals of the Soviet Union, all 11 deputy ministers of defense, 75 of the 80 members of the military Soviet, all the commanders of the military districts, 13 of the 15 army commanders, more than half the corps commanders, and approximately 30% of the officers below brigade level. The performance of the Russian tank forces was affected by three major considerations. The first one was that during the purges in the late 1930s, early 1940s, well over 90% of all the tank commanders were shot. And so there was a, um, a dearth of experienced tank commanders. A lot of the senior commanders who were actually replaced after the fiasco in Finland in 1940, they were actually reinstated, even though they were, had a poor track record, they went back in and commanded these units. The units, because they were so large, because there was over 24,000 tanks, the Russians really couldn't afford to spend a great deal of time training the crews. And most of the training that the crews had had was for the exercises more for the um, Politburo and for propaganda purposes rather than actual tactical exercises. And the third factor was there was very little in the way or almost no spare parts. So when a vehicle broke down, unless they cannibalized another vehicle, there was no spare parts for that vehicle. This great offensive, codenamed Barbarossa, had been fermenting for a long time in Hitler's mind. Firmly rooted in national socialist ideology was the conviction that Germany's destiny lay in the East. Once more, Hitler needed a quick war. Once more, he needed it soon. It was his instinct that Germany would never stand so strong as she stood then. His gambler's instinct told him that if he delayed even one year, the crowds that cheered the latest successes so fervently might no longer be willing to follow him into so hazardous an adventure. And there was no greater military adventure than the invasion of Russia. As the German build-up towards Operation Barbarossa continued, Stalin's attempts to pacify Hitler grew more desperate. 
Stalin felt he was continuing to buy time by these unrequited concessions. But his use of the breathing space, which he had already obtained, was totally devoid of any worthwhile attempt to remedy his military disadvantages. Stalin was well aware that sooner or later the Germans would attack, but what accompanied this was as follows, actually. It, there was also the assumption, very deftly introduced by the Germans, that in fact, before this attack, there could well be negotiations. There might even be, and the Russians now have disclosed this, there might even have been a personal meeting between Hitler and Stalin. And Stalin therefore became persuaded that there were two elements to this German position. One was that the massive German military buildup was in fact, uh, if you like, uh, not an inducement, but a form of coercion to force him into a negotiating position. And on uh, June the 14th, he made this perfectly plain by the famous TASS statement saying, look, we know what you're up to. We, we know all about these concentrations, but there is nothing to prevent a settlement of Soviet-German relations. That was the first thing. The second thing was a certain element of self-deception on Stalin's side to the effect that, one, he strongly believed that Hitler would never embark on a two-front war. And the second thing was, again, Stalin's great concern that although the Soviet general staff, Zhukov and Vasilevsky and others, were, uh, and particularly Tymoshenko, were urging Stalin to mobilize, Stalin argued actually, and he shouted at Tymoshenko, what do you want, a war? Because the, the act of mobilization, full formal mobilization, essentially would trigger war. Indeed, even on the morning of the 22nd of June 1941, when the German armor is advancing, he's still partly persuaded of what he, what he thought was a provocatia. He even imagined it was some breakaway German generals who were trying it on, as it were. This wasn't the real thing. So that the explanation of Soviet unreadiness is much more complex than the fact that, yes, they knew about it, B, they did nothing about it. Uh, and it was certainly plain from Stalin's statements that he did expect a war, which he hoped through his diplomacy and his general political initiatives to postpone to 1942. The reality of it was that Hitler meant every word he said. He would attack on the 22nd of June 41, and he did attack. By June 1941, with a German attack imminent, the Western Special Military District on which the blow would fall was nothing short of a shambles. Many divisions were between six to 7,000 men short of wartime establishment. Levies of experienced personnel had been hived off to build new tank and aviation units. Only one of six mechanized corps had received their full complement of equipment. Three of the four motorized divisions had no tanks, and four out of every five vehicles in the tank fleets were obsolete. Four of the corps had only one quarter of their designated motor vehicles, and in another four, one in three motor vehicles needed repairs. Although the two opposing forces had amassed vast amounts of weaponry along their common borders, the Soviet Red Army and the German Wehrmacht were anything but equal adversaries. Russian armored warfare was inhibited by Stalin's disenchantment with tank divisions, which had led him in the 30s to utilize his armor only in the support of infantry formations. After witnessing German successes on the Western Front in 1940, Stalin changed his mind. But the reorganization of Russian armor was not completed before the launch of Barbarossa. Even though Russian tanks outnumbered German two to one at the front and six to one overall, tactical ineffectiveness, obsolete models and widespread disrepair tipped the advantage overwhelmingly in favor of Germany during the first stages of the conflict. In the western part of Russia, the Red Army consisted of about five million men. The tank strength of the Red Army on the 21st of June, 1941, was 23,108, of which possibly 8,000 were battle-ready and in good condition. Typical of the Russian tank forces in the early part of the war was the T-26. Well, the T-26 was built under license from a design that was originally created by Vickers Armstrong in about 1928, so it was a British tank. You can always tell it was a good tank because the British Army never ordered it. It was purely a commercial offering and the Russians took to it in a big way. 
and they got a license, it was all done above board, and then put a much better gun in it than the British had done. They had a 45 mm anti-tank weapon, which is actually quite effective against contemporary tanks. So from that point of view, it was an excellent little vehicle. It was reliable, but it was very, very rough. The actual suspension, the wheels and tracks that it runs on, gave people a very hard ride. And of course, like all tanks of the pre-war period, it's of bolted construction, so it's weak when it comes to defending itself against incoming rounds. But generally speaking, for its day, an excellent little tank. Just on a historical note, that what makes this tank interesting is that it was captured from the Russian army by the Finns during the Winter War. They did some minor modifications, used it for a while in their army, and then latterly they buried all these tanks in their defensive regions, particularly what was known as the Mannerheim line, and the tank was buried, so in its turret was showing, it became part of the fixed defences. Back in the, uh, the sort of 70s and 80s, they started digging up the Mannerheim line, suddenly produced all these tanks, and we were able to do an exchange with them to get it for the tank museum, which is great, because it means we have a representative example, not only of a pre-war Russian tank, which is quite something to have, but also something which derived originally from a British design, and we have the British design from which it came also in the museum, so historically it's interesting. I should point out, of course, that the swastika on the turret has absolutely nothing to do with the Nazis. It is uh, a Finnish symbol, uh, one of the runic symbols that they employed, so it, it, in this case there's no Nazi association at all. On the German side, the field strength was roughly about three and a half million men. With the addition of the German allies, the Finns, the Slovaks and the Hungarians, the figure rises to nearly four million. In infantry, the Germans were therefore outnumbered by one million men at the outset. In terms of armour, the discrepancies were even larger. The Germans were able to employ something like 3,300 tanks to face the Russian 8,000. But numbers don't tell the whole story. In the case of Barbarossa, numbers are extremely misleading. Considering the operational readiness of the armies, the Wehrmacht was clearly superior. It was also battle-hardened, experienced, and it was well-prepared and briefed for its task. By comparison, the Red Army suffered severe problems of manning, organization, training, logistics, supply. Even more importantly, the Germans were operating according to a carefully conceived master plan. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Red Army was in an extraordinary position. There was no recognizable military plan. The Red Army could neither defend nor attack. Many of its tanks were not suitable for the demands of World War II. The tank army, by 1936, was probably the biggest in the world. They not only had these little fellas, they had a series of tanks known as the BT series, which had been derived from the American Christie machine, some of the fastest tanks on Earth. And this massive army of tanks wiped out largely in the initial stages of Barbarossa, meant that the Russians had to rethink their designs and start again. So you almost, and it would be a dream to some tank armies, get a clean sweep of the board. And the Russians then come back with the T-34, arguably one of the best tanks of the Second World War, and the heavy KV series tanks, which they then fitted into their army. So really what you're seeing is the Germans kindly clearing up for the Russians a load of old junk which they'd had on their hands since the mid-30s. The first part of the war was really not an occasion for praising tank commanders. That was a martyrdom of Soviet uh, tank troops. Though one or two people did emerge which were very important. For example, um, uh, Chernyakhovsky, who was very young, he must have been about, yes, he was just in his very early 30s. He commanded a, a tank division in the terrible days of 1941 and really proved himself to be a very capable commander. He, in fact, went on to become not only an army commander, but a front commander. That gives you some idea of the caliber of these people. 
The awesome German armies, which the 170 understrength divisions of the Russian troops faced, were divided into three large groups. These consisted of 148 fully manned and equipped divisions. The German armor was grouped into 19 Panzer and 15 Panzer Grenadier divisions. The army group south was commanded by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt and was charged with seizing Kiev and taking control of the Ukraine as far as the river Dnieper. Field Marshal von Bock's army group center was to strike towards Smolensk. Army Group North under Field Marshal von Lieb was to attack through the Baltic states and seize Leningrad. Army Group Center was a larger formation than the forces which comprised the other two army groups. It had 50 German divisions as opposed to 39 in Army Group South and only 29 in Army Group North. It could deploy 910 aircraft as opposed to 684 Army Group South and 434 Army Group North. The two panzer groups under von Bock's control in Army Group Center also claimed the lion's share of the tanks which were allocated to the great attack. Some 1,700 machines were available to von Bock, as opposed to 1,000 for von Rundstedt with Army Group South and 650 in Army Group Center with von Lee. The three German army groups were supplemented by 500,000 Finnish troops advancing from their homeland in 14 divisions and 150,000 Romanians attacking along the Black Sea towards Odessa. These forces, together with the Luftwaffe, which had devoted 80% of its operational strength, 2,770 aircraft, to the build-up of Barbarossa, fielded over 3,350 tanks, over 7,000 artillery pieces, 60,000 motor vehicles and 625,000 horses. The Russian army still clung to its peacetime structure. Should war occur, then each military district would be transformed into army groupings, similar in structure to the Germans, which mirrored the German intentions. The North Soviet front was to repel advances through the Baltic states and defend Leningrad from Finnish attack. The Northwest, West and Southwest fronts would engage the three main German army groups and the Southern front would deal with any advance towards Odessa. Behind these similarities, the contrast between the warring nations could not have been greater. While Germany boasted one of the finest industrial infrastructures in the world, Russia had still not completed her industrial revolution. Stalin had declared in 1931 that one feature of old Russia was the continual beatings that she suffered for falling behind for her backwardness, for military backwardness, for agricultural backwardness. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or they crush us. Ironically, the enemy which might now attempt to crush the Soviet Union was to rely heavily on tanks, which the Russians had helped to develop. Between 1926 and 1933, the Red Army and the Reichswehr collaborated in secret on the development of weapons, on the development of tactics, on the development, by the way, of chemical weapons. Uh, and uh, the Russians were very interested in German ideas, and the Germans were very interested in Russian ideas, obviously. And there was, a, yeah, there was a, a, certainly a form of exchange there. Uh, and uh, by the way, Many Russians today say that what really happened was German, early German successes were actually based on Soviet theory. Well, that's a little bit of national pride being thrown in. Undoubtedly, both sides were interested in the potentialities of the tank. That's very true. And the second thing they were interested in was the relationship between air ground cooperation between the tank and the dive bomber. Yes, that was true. But I don't think that's a justification for for arguing that the Blitzkrieg and Soviet operations in depth are the same, because they're not. They're really not. The way, partly in the way in which they are practiced, they are different, and partly the manner in which what objectives they set themselves are also different as well. By the early 30s, 10 prototype tanks had been designed and built in secret. The initial development of what would become the most technically accomplished and cost-effective tank program ever seen took place at the German-Soviet tank school at Kazan in Russia. 
The firm grip of the party on the state meant that the Russian people were deprived of any suspicion of the huge build-up along their borders. The state-controlled media was devoid of any mention of the increasingly anti-Soviet rhetoric of Hitler, which may have provided a clue. They were totally unprepared, therefore, for the latest disaster which was about to descend on them. At last, at 0400, on the 22nd of June, 1941, the code word, Dortmund, crackled down the wires and the maelstrom that was Barbarossa finally erupted. The German armies of the Blitzkrieg sliced through the Russian forces on every front. Faced by the results of his intransigent refusal to act, Stalin panicked. While his army headquarters desperately tried to piece together the most rudimentary picture of what was happening, he ordered an immediate counter-offensive on all fronts. As the first reports of the devastation his own command had helped to create filtered through, he was shattered. All that Lenin created we have lost forever, he declared. He finally retreated to his Dakar, not to emerge until the 3rd of July. But what really stunned the Red Army commanders was that the massive German assault proceeded without any artillery support. It simply sliced through. The Red Army command had expected that there would be meeting engagements and opening actions that would develop over a period of days. Next would come a large series of complex frontier engagements, and then the real war would begin. What actually happened was that in 48 hours, in Army Group North, German panzer columns were approaching Riga. At the beginning of the war, Soviet tank training was terrible. It was awful. The tank drivers had very little, little experience, probably maybe two, three hours on it, if they had that, by the way. The level of actually handling a tank, and fighting a tank, was extremely low, and it showed. It showed in the disaster which was visited on the Red Army's tank forces. The level of the training of the commanders was very poor. And that changed, it changed importantly. The Soviet the training methods were completely overhauled at the end of 1942 and 1943. Uh, it was no good just pushing people in tanks and saying, get on with it, do this. It, they, they realized that for the tank force they had and what the tank force had to do, you really need highly trained crews. In the opening days of the campaign, the two panzer groups of Army Group Center, under Hoth and Guderian, completed the encirclement of a huge hall of confused and virtually leaderless Russians near Bialystok, then surged onwards towards Minsk. This refined blitzkrieg technique of the Germans and the use of their armor in that respect came as an extraordinary and totally disorganizing surprise, even to the senior Russian commanders. Within 48 hours, general staff reports made it perfectly plain they had lost control of the situation. They were in complete chaos, and many didn't know where their troops were or what was happening. They certainly didn't have accurate reports of German movements, and they were not quite sure where the German thrusts were aimed at. All that they did know was to the south. Army Group South was being slightly delayed. But in the northwest and in the west, there was total collapse. In consequence, Stalin operated his usual practice. He took out the front commanders and shot them. At the front, the rapier thrusts of the German panzer divisions were skewering through the chaotic Russian defenses. The panzer groups created deadly breaches in the Soviet line, slicing the Red Army forces into isolated segments. The supporting German divisions then moved forward in encircling advances which surrounded these pockets of defenders. The ferocity and effectiveness of the panzer attacks was so great that some of the pockets were gigantic. Groups of up to 15 Russian divisions were surrounded and mercilessly pummeled into surrender. The encirclement of Minsk by the right flank of Army Group North and the left flank of Army Group Center yielded 300,000 prisoners, 2,500 tanks, 1,400 artillery pieces, 
32 of the 43 Russian divisions were emasculated within a week, and the road to Moscow penetrated to a depth of 300 kilometers. The remainder of Army Group North scythed into the Baltic states, capturing Riga, the Latvian capital. Only in the south were the German forces limited to shallow advances towards Lvov and Rauno. On the ground, chaos reigned. The Luftwaffe were pulverizing the road and rail links behind the Russian lines. Many officers were not even bothering to use code in their desperate pleas for instructions from their headquarters. Struggling masses of uncoordinated troops were being slaughtered by the German troops as they attempted to obey Stalin's orders to counterattack. Others were being machine gunned by their own military police for fleeing from positions which were worse than hopeless. The reality was that the Soviet forces were left leaderless. They had no orders. Sometimes they had guns but no ammunition. Sometimes they had tanks but no fuel, or they had tanks which broke down with no prospect of repair. Or they simply had orders which were contradictory. The usual situation was that if in doubt, Red Army commanders would simply order advance. Many of the Red Army divisions simply broke up and formed very large pockets of Red Army troops. For example, within a matter of four or five days, the Wehrmacht, the German army in the east, had managed to encircle 350,000 Red Army soldiers, the first of what was to prove a number of huge encirclements. By the 3rd of July, the battle for the frontier was over. The German armies had advanced along a line from the river Dvina in the north to the Dnieper in the south. General Halder, chief of German general staff, declared that the war against the Soviet Union had taken only 14 days to win. But the German intelligence had totally underestimated the reserves which Russia could command. The Red Army had a great number of men, but the equipment that it used tended to be outdated and obsolete. This was particularly with regard to tanks and aircraft. In terms of signals equipment, the Red Army's position on the Western Front was quite appalling. It simply did not have the communications equipment to enable it to fight the fast-moving battles the German Army specialised in. And they would be required to fight effectively in order to defend their country properly and to achieve the initiative. Therefore, it can be concluded in terms of leadership, position and equipment, tanks, aircraft and communications, the Russian forces facing Army Group Center was no way a match for their German counterpart. The invasion forces scythed through hopelessly disorganized opposition and moved rapidly onwards. Well honed, the blitzkrieg pattern was being repeated and the Soviet defenses whirled away like chaff in the wind. The number of prisoners taken seemed too immense to be true, but it was, and the scale of destruction was terrifying. As the news of Barbarossa reverberated around a stunned and disbelieving world, even Germany was awestruck. Not all the German generals joined the celebration. General Heinz Kuderian, who still held relatively junior rank, had been appalled by the headlong advances against two far-flung objectives. He was acutely aware that the guiding principle of Blitzkrieg was the concentration of maximum force against a single objective. This had already been neglected, and where there should be convergence, there was divergence. As the army groups advanced, they moved further away from one another, instead of coming closer. Audacious though he undoubtedly was, Hitler balked at the thought of his precious armoured units racing too far or too deep into the Soviet hinterland, and settled instead for a compromise with the more traditional grand strategy of envelopment. By the end of June, 
Guderian and Hoth's tanks had joined near Minsk to complete a huge encirclement, and by mid-August, Army Group North was approaching Leningrad. The Germans continued to achieve extraordinary success, and the Wehrmacht surged on with undiminished impetus. Incredible numbers of prisoners were taken and huge quantities of tanks and guns captured or destroyed. Despite this sustained progress, Guderian was increasingly conscious of grounds for unease in the development of the campaign. The unending immensity of the land depressed many soldiers. Lack of mobility, particularly of tracked vehicles, was a severe drawback. There continued to be a huge haul of prisoners, but the German pincers were closing too slowly, allowing large numbers of Red Army troops to get away, and the Red Army appeared to command endless reserves. Most roads were of dirt, which, with the sudden rains turning quickly to mud, halted entire columns. Meanwhile, Hitler was vacillating. Having failed to annihilate the Red Army, his interest turned towards securing the economic prize of the Ukrainian oil wells. To Guderian's dismay, he was diverted from his plan to drive hard and fast for Moscow. The capture of the Russian capital would have been a profound psychological shock for the Soviets. Instead, Guderian was ordered south to the Ukraine to link up with Hoth. His division still performed outstandingly, helping to take well over half a million prisoners and nearly 1,000 tanks. But the crucial moment of the campaign had already passed. The Germans were confronted with another and equally unpleasant surprise at this time. The first Russian T-34 tanks appeared during the Battle of Vyazma. At Verea, the Russian tanks simply drove straight through the 7th Infantry Division onto the artillery positions and literally ran over the guns. The effect on the infantrymen's morale was devastating. This marked the beginning of what came to be called the Tank Terror. We've come here to North Norfolk, to the Muckleborough Collection, to have a look at this, the T-34. In many respects, this is the vehicle that actually won the Second World War. They were manufactured in such quantity that they swamped the German forces, and they really had no answer to the sheer numbers of T-34s which appeared on the battlefield. There were something like 50,000 of these that were manufactured during the war period. It's by no means a beautifully finished machine, but it was solid and it was very, very workmanlike. Uh, when you consider that there were only something like 1,700 Tigers which were manufactured, they had to face 50,000 of these, and on the Allied side, 50,000 Shermans allied to all the British types. So you can appreciate that it didn't have to be the best tank in the world, but in many respects it was a very, very solid performer. It was, it was made with the Russian conditions in mind. It had wide tracks, it had the simple suspension based on the Christie model and this tank really had everything that was needed to allow it to be mass produced in the Russian economy in the kind of numbers that arrived just in time. And there's no doubt that a tank like a Tiger was a far better machine. It was better engineered, it had a bigger, harder hitting gun and it was better protected. But what they couldn't cope with were the numbers of these medium tanks which weighed in at around 30 tonnes but could move quickly and above all could deal with the Russian mud and the snow in a way that until the advent of the later German tanks none of the early models could. It was absolutely different to everything else that was available then. Strong armour, sloping armour, uh, machine guns fitted, one here for the radio operator to fire from another coaxial one to be fired out of that hole and that this other hole is for the gun layer to look through and lay the gun. Driver sits here and next to him is the radio operator as I said who, who will fire the gun and the other three men, the commander, the early one did not have a commander as such, the commander at the top with the vision all round, the gun layer and the loader which was a, quite a difficult job in there. The 
P34 embodied everything as close as possible to perfection which could be expected from a tank at the time. Speed, protection, firepower and most of all reliability because that's the worst thing which could happen on a tank, especially on a modern German tank at the time, to break down somewhere, miles from anywhere and not be able to get going. This, as I said earlier, is the 85 millimeter gun, which was very, very good. But the Russian optics perhaps were not quite as good as the Germans, which meant lesser shells hit their target than they might have done on the German Tiger, for instance. One of the best things on this tank, well, everything is good, as I said earlier, but one of the best reliable things is the engine itself. Now, this tank was made in 1943, but the engine hasn't changed very much to this very day. Actually, the very same engine with a slightly higher power output is put in the T-55, the very same engine, develops about 30 or 40 more horsepower, that's all. Designed in the very early 40s and still up to date. If you look closely on this edge, you see how rough the manufacture of the tank was. I mean, it's unbelievable. Here, the hole didn't quite line up, so with a burner, they cut the hole a bit bigger, you see. <laughs> but they turned out 45,000 of these things, you see. They knew very well it hasn't got a long life expectancy, so a little bit rough edge or there was didn't matter. The enormous turret, if you take a look at that, it's very heavy. You wouldn't think anybody could move it. But let me tell you, if that tank gets a direct hit, a penetra armor penetrating shell inside, and sets of its own ammunition by it, the whole turret as it is will be blown sky high and sail through the air 10 or 12 yards. That's the force of an exploding tank. Its own ammunition and its own petrol, uh, diesel, what have you. In 1941, the T-34 was impervious to the infantry's anti-tank weapons. At that time, the German infantry was equipped only with 37mm and 50mm anti-tank guns. But they had no effect on the T-34. A gun of at least 75mm calibre was needed, but it first had to be designed and built. In the meantime, only 88mm anti-aircraft guns could be relied upon, and those were hurriedly pressed into the anti-tank role. Still, Russia was not defeated. By the end of August, 5,300,000 men had been mobilized. Stalin had emerged from his isolation to broadcast a message of patriotism and resistance to the nation. For once, the Russian people were told the truth. Stalin now took direct control of the Red Army. The pre-war complacency which he himself had done so much to foster had now rapidly to be undone. But the general mobilization of Russian troops failed to curtail the German advance. Four reserve armies of 37 divisions were dispatched to bolster the West Front in the general area of Smolensk. The Germans countered with yet another encirclement, and the panzer groups of Generals Hoth and Guderian smashed through the Soviet line and maneuvered 300,000 Russian troops into an indefensible pocket. Another 150,000 prisoners 2,000 tanks and 2,000 artillery pieces fell into German hands. Drunk with anticipation, Goebbels announced that the eastern continent lies like a limp virgin in the mighty arms of the German Mars. Spurred on by the successful actions of their commands, the men of Army Group South finally broke through the Russian southwest front, and another pocket yielded a further toll of 100,000 prisoners. At the outbreak of war in the East, the backbone of the Panzer Corps was the Panzer Mark IV. Designed by Krupp and weighing 17.3 tons, the Panzer Kampfwagen IV carried a crew of five at a maximum speed of 18 and a half miles an hour. Its armor varied in thickness from 8 to 30 centimeters, and it was armed with a 75 millimeter turret gun and two machine guns. Supported by the lighter Mark III, which was similar in size and appearance, the Mark IV swept all before it until the Russian T-34 tank made its appearance in numbers. <laughs> 
Despite the confusion which surrounded her armed forces, the Red Army had tried in 1940 and 1941 to bring in two new tanks. The T-34, which had been successfully tested in 1939, and the heavier KV-1 tank. But so far, they only produced about a thousand of each. The T-34s and KV-1s were distributed in very small packets on a battlefront about 2,000 miles long. Nonetheless, when they did meet German armor, it did come as an enormous shock the first time that the Germans encountered them, particularly the T-34. The superior quality of the T-34's armor, mobility, speed, and gunpower was something they simply hadn't suspected. Guderian himself ran into a T-34 ambush in November 1941, and his force was almost completely destroyed. Guderian was pushing forward to Moscow and had swung round from the south and was approaching Tula. And for the first time, he was met not by one or two T-34 tanks, but a perfectly organized, competently commanded uh, Soviet tank brigade, commanded by a man called Katukov. And this is where the Germans really learned what the T-34 could do. And the alarm bells rang throughout Germany, and for the first time one began to see how these tank forces could be handled. But it wasn't just the quality of the tanks which counted. It was the capability of the Panzer commanders to control their armor that was essential. They had excellent command control facilities, and also at that time they had very good support and logistical facilities. So that although German Mark II and Mark III's might run up against a huge KV-1, the big heavy tank, such was the haphazard and untrained manner in which the Russians handled their armor that the Germans soon learned to defeat them, even with inferior armor. But there were a few hard lessons to be learnt first. One of these was the emergence of the KV-1. After a month of victorious progress, the German high command were disconcerted by the rapidity of their own advance. Their armies were now fighting on a front 1,000 miles wide. The Stukas could no longer deliver the concerted hammer blows which had punched the holes in the Russian lines, which the Panzers had so mercilessly exploited. The lengthening supply lines were also affecting the German ground forces. Tank commanders, hundreds of miles from their Polish depots, nevertheless pressed for the final thrust towards Moscow. They argued that only the continuation of the offensive would prevent the Russians from organizing a fresh line of resistance. While many of Hitler's generals disagreed that such an attack should be launched immediately, they were almost unanimous in recommending that Moscow should become the primary objective of the next phase of the war. Hitler, on the other hand, was worried about the possibility of the gaps between the panzer divisions and the main armies being exploited by Russian reinforcements. Hitler had never been fully convinced of the importance of Moscow and continued to regard it as a secondary objective. The debate stretched out until mid-August. A vital month of summer weather was wasted. The Russians had the breathing space to throw reserve divisions into the gaps in their defences. Barely trained, poorly equipped, some in the battered remnants of their civilian clothing, their stubborn ferocity meant that they were still a force to be reckoned with. A rapid campaign to crush Russia, which should have been over by August, had not achieved its objectives. The German high command had to think again, and the first thing that they had to think about was logistics and supplies. No great preparation had been made for a winter campaign in Russia. Neither were their tanks equipped for the job in hand. Eventually, the objections of the generals were overruled, and not one, but two major objectives were prioritized by Hitler, who demanded the simultaneous capture of Moscow and the fall of the Ukraine. He decided that the general Heinz Guderian and his second panzer group should be diverted south to assist the German army group fighting there, instead of concentrating on the final drive towards Moscow. With hindsight, it was to prove a disastrous intervention. Although at the time, Hitler appeared to have been vindicated. As seen here, in the newsreels of the time, Guderian and his tanks were able to penetrate deep into Soviet territory. <laughs> 
They were to contribute to the huge victory when they combined with the panzer forces of Army Group South under von Kleist to produce a stunning encirclement which produced a vast haul of prisoners. This footage shows the link-up between the tanks of Guderian with the white G and von Kleist, whose vehicles are marked with the white K. It was not just in the ranks of the German army that strategic errors were being made, as the Russians too made some costly blunders. The giant pincer movement involving half of Army Group Center and the left flank of Army Group South began to close its jaws on a huge pocket of Russian forces to the rear of Kiev. Field Marshal Zhukov, the Soviet Chief of Staff, pleaded with Stalin for a strategic withdrawal of the troops defending the city. He was dismissed from his post. Marshal Timoshenko, the newly appointed Southwest commander, arrived just in time to see the trapped Soviet divisions march into captivity. With the help of Panzer Group II from Army Group Center, von Kleist's Panzer Group I was able to complete the encirclement of a further huge pocket of dazed Russian prisoners outside Kiev. This time, a staggering 650,000 men marched into captivity. Army Group South had played its part in the largest victory in history. The unfortunate captives had nothing to celebrate. The 650,000 prisoners taken by the Germans remains the highest number ever captured in a single engagement. The battle for the Ukraine now centered on the Crimean Peninsula, where the right flank of Army Group South pressed the Soviet 51st Army back towards Sebastopol. While half of the German Group Center were engaged in subduing the Ukraine, Marshal Zhukov transferred to the reserve forces behind West Front, seized the opportunity to attack the German 4th Army. Occupying a salient near Smolensk, the Germans were now themselves vulnerable to encirclement. The German 4th Army were thrown back 12 kilometers, but without sufficient tanks and aircraft, Zhukov failed to tighten the noose he had made. However, in terms of morale, Zhukov's counterthrust was highly significant. His action was the first substantial Soviet counterattack of the war. The advance to Moscow was resumed at the end of September. But the delay proved to be fatal. Fuel and supplies were delivered through a system that had become frequently inefficient, if not corrupt, and the lines of communication were enormously overextended. Shortages of every kind impaired the fighting ability of the frontline forces. The vague fears of the generals, who had initially harbored doubts, were beginning to take the shape of a massive problem. The advance had been over areas so vast that it was impossible for comprehensive mopping up operations to be undertaken. Behind the Germans, there lay the huge expanses of territory in which tens of thousands of Red Army troops roamed uncaptured. Blitzkrieg's lifeblood was rapid movement, and the spearheads were now being reduced to a perilously slow crawl. There was something seriously, seriously wrong with the Blitzkrieg technique. It didn't fit in Russia. From the Soviet side, they began to realize that there were these shortcomings in the German blitzkrieg approach, and that uh, the first job that the, the Russians had to do at immense cost was actually to halt this, to stop the blitzkrieg, literally to stop its movement. This was a very difficult lesson they had to learn. And um, the first thing was that they really had, uh, this was a very painful lesson for them, they really had to learn the lessons of, of active and effective defense it was no good setting up a system of, of constant uh, uh, and continued uh, uh, counterblows and counterattacks. All that happened there was you simply incurred very heavy casualties and you really didn't do anything as the Germans regrouped and reorganized. The autumn rains were heavy. In France, there had been metalled roads. Here, the highways were vanishing into impassable tracts of mud in which men, vehicles and horses floundered more and more helplessly. Breakdowns increased. 
and repairs became extremely difficult to carry out. One of the disadvantages of a tank like the Panzer III can be seen down here in the tracks. Compared to the T-34, for example, they're comparatively narrow. And the reason for that is that these machines were designed with Western Europe in mind. Uh, the, the Great War was still fresh in the minds of everybody who was designing these tanks. Uh, and as a consequence, no one had really given serious consideration to the possibility that they might have to operate in Russia. Uh, and when they did, particularly in the winter of 1941, it came as a severe surprise to the German to find that the conditions were just so extreme. You had these bottomless seas of mud and you had these extensive snow conditions, which meant that really a vehicle needed wide tracks to be able to negotiate conditions like that. Guderian had started Barbarossa with 600 tanks. By the middle of November, he was left with just 50 that were operational. By the end of October, Army Group South held a line which ran from approximately Kharkov in the north to the Black Sea in the south. The limit of the advance in that first year of the war proved to be the city of Rostov on Don. The forces of Army Group South, with their supply lines massively overstretched and the troops exhausted, could at present do no more for Adolf Hitler. It was not enough for the Fuhrer. During the bitter winter of 1941, fierce Russian counterattacks began to push the German forces backwards. Rundstedt, for the first time in the campaign, asked for permission to withdraw. Hitler refused and Rundstedt resigned. But it made no difference on the ground. The withdrawal from Rostov had to be carried out as a matter of military necessity. The situation was just too difficult, and the German forces withdrew in good order 40 miles west of Rostov. It was the first retreat of the war in the south. 